So good morning, this is Geo 420 Hydrogeology. We're going to be lecturing today, April 28th. Um, I had originally anticipated on doing some uh, Python uh, well estimation, and we will do that, but I'm running into some Python 3, Python 2 compatibility issues that I can't figure out right at the moment. So um, we're going to switch gears a little bit, lecture today on slug tests, and then um, uh, I will get this uh, program running for um, well estimation using um, using Python. Now one of the things I was just going to do here is check assignment four here and So one of the, uh, probably the main effect this is gonna have is the uh, calculating storativity and transmissivity using the TICE method, using the Python utility. So this is would be number 5B. Um, and it works on Python 2.7 right now, but it doesn't work on Python 3. So, and some of you have Python three, so let's let's do this. Let's just um, let's take out five B. Uh, let's remove that from your homework because we're not going to get to it in time for you guys to do it as part of homework. So I'm going to re remove five B will not be graded on the homework. Is that clear for everybody? I will make an announcement on Moodle. Um, you already did the curve matching method. So you've already done 5A. Um, and so five, you've already done most of problem five. Um, all right, the other thing we needed to talk about was problem four. So the data for problem four is up on the, on the website. Let me open up the packet here. And I'll share my screen. Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to do today is just touch on what I want for problem four. And I'm going to move us into 420 and homework four, and I'll make a new page four. Okay, so uh, in your homework, you've got, um, or in this packet that's been uploaded to the Moodle site for homework four, um, you've got a bunch of drill and well logs for two transects of wells. One is, um, one is at, the Montana Department of Transportation, or MDOT. Um, and one is at Dance Hall. 
So the first set of well logs is for the dance hall site. Um, this is on the main map of the lower part of Lolo Creek. So um, the dance hall site is on lower Lolo Creek, not far from the town of Lolo. And there's um, a few different boreholes here. And what you've got is well logs. Okay, so <clears throat> at each one of these well logs, um, you've got a drawing. So here is Highway 12. Here is uh, Lolo Creek. And here is a drawing of um, uh, the location from Lolo Creek of this well, all right? Now, what I want you to do is go in here and you're going to read the log and you're gonna sort of summarize it. So from six to 10 feet, we were in clay and silk covered gravel. From 10 to 12, you know, we we're in silt clay, 13 feet, clay, coarse gravel. 13 to 17 feet, fine gravel to fine sand. Um, so what you're gonna do is come in and start making uh, plots or sketches of the, of the stratigraphy. So you would take this file, this borehole file, And you would start to draw out stratigraphy. So what we want is by the end, what I want is some conceptual cross section here of the stratigraphy. So I've got down to 60 feet here. So this would be 60 feet depth. Here's land surface. And all right, so for the first sort of 10 feet, I know I'm in clay. So I might have a mark here, 10 feet, and I'm in clays with some gravels. All right. Um, in fact, I'd say that clay gravel goes pretty much clay brown, coarse gravel, silt clay coated gravel. So I'm going to go clay and gravel it is 13 feet on this borehole log. Beneath that, you know, 13 to 17 feet, fine gravel and cobbles and sand. So here I got sand and cobbles. Um, really from, in fact, I'm gonna get rid of this one all the way to 28 feet it's the same as above so we have sort of sands with some gravel um so then the next things i see here we got uh, back into sort of a, um, so this would be down to 28, this is from 13 to 28 feet depth. 
Um, beneath that, we get back into sort of silty gravel. Uh, down really to 47 feet, silt, clay, gravel. I'm going to go that's all the way to 56 feet. Uh, so 54, thickly clay brown gravel, 48, 60, clay brown gravel, some fine sand, same as above. So 57 feet, we have fine sand and coarse gravel. Um, and that's pretty much all the way down to the base. So right here, I would probably actually just get rid of this one and come down here. So here's 57 feet. So here we're in clays and gravels. And then we're back into a sandy gravel. All right, so this is for one borehole. What I want you to do is start to be able to sketch. So here's, um, this would be for well, one, this is my lithology. Then we'd come over here to well two and we'd plot its lithology. Um, so we just did well, um, So we first, we just did dance hall 21. Um, and then Is this the same well log, dance hall 21? All right, so the one we just did, I think, is actually dance hall 20. So this was DH20. And then DH21, dance hall 21. This one only goes to 25 feet. All right, and we're gonna look at, you're gonna look at the, the well log from that one. So fine gravel, silt covered, fine sand to gray gravel from five to seven feet. Uh, and so part of the thing that you're gonna have to deal with and this is what happens in real life is that even though these wells are very close together, so here's Dance Hall 21, here's Dance Hall 20, uh, here's Lolo Creek, right? They're right next to each other and they're not very far from, the Lo from Lolo Creek. Both of these um, well logs are, are different. So this one was fine gravel and silt not too different for the first seven uh, clay silt covered gravel. So first 13 feet, I'd say clay silt and gravel seem to work. 13 to 70 feet silt covered gravel, uh, cobbles and sand course. So that seems to be working all the way up to 22 feet um, and really all the way to 25 feet. There, the descriptions are a little different, but you know, I would say this stratigraphy that I just drew would sort of work for both of these well logs. We've got more fines and cobbles 
in the top 13 feet or so. And then beneath 13 feet, it's, it's more sand and gravels, all right? So this is how you take these well logs and start to stitch together and come up with a conceptual model of your area. Um, so this is what I'm looking for, our conceptual cross section. So you take the borehole log, you're gonna interpret the stratigraphy, and then over here, you're gonna have to have a key that says, okay, this symbol here is a clay clay and gravel. And then this symbol here, sand and gravel. All right, so this is your goal is to try and come up with these kind of cross sections. I want them uh, mapped out from the borehole logs. I want depths from land surface and I want stratigraphy. Um, and I need to be able to read them. Um, all right, so does that make sense? Your data is up uh, on the wet, on Moodle. And you've got to do this for two cross sections, Dance Hall and Montana Department of Transportation. Uh, uh, do we need to draw the stream from uh, which directions stream is going to? Um, right now, you, you could put, so, you know, I'd say a A plus, you know, extra credit would have stream level and water level in the wells. But I don't really, yeah. what I really want out of you guys, June, is the stratigraphy. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wondered, so there's no information. You get that information. Yeah. Uh, and had we been able to go on the field trip, these is, this is the kind of information we would have got and we would be able to draw this cross section right now. But um, basically, you, you're gonna, you'd have to go and get all the different data. Um, so right now, what I really want is just the stratigraphy and the conceptual model of the hydro stratigraphy. I know what else I want. I want you to label which one of these units where you think aquifers would be and where you think uh, confining units would be. So here, you know, I might mark out this one and this one, the sands and gravels as my aquifers. And these guys with more clays and silts as potential confining units. So one of these wells is screened over the top 25. Uh, one of them is screened in this sort of, only goes to 25 feet in the first place, and then is screened only in, the, in this sort of lower zone. And one of them goes to 60 feet and, um, Let's see what they screen the H20 over. So this is DH21. It is screened um, from 19 feet down to 24 feet, all right? Um, top is 19, 
Uh, it's a two inch 20 slot. That's just the size of the screen. And the screen bottom is 24. So this guy, DH21 screen from 19 to 24 feet, all right, in this sort of upper aquifer. If we go and look here at DH20, top of the screen is uh, 54.5. And the bottom is 59.5. So it's really screened over in this bottom interval. Really from 54. Down to 60 feet. Okay, so you can kind of see where, where I drew the clays and the cobbles, you might sit, think are confining units, where I drew the sands and the cobbles might be aquifers, and you can see that they screened preferentially in those aquifers because that's what they're trying to sample, right? So they have a shallow well and they've got a deep well. And this is a really typical configuration to look at the relationship between different aquifers and the relationship between these different aquifers and the river. Um, So you can see one of the things that's interesting, like, so now that I've got a conceptual model, I can see that uh, DH20 is, uh, so this well, DH20, it's finished in the deep aquifer, um, which looks like potentially could have a confining unit between it and the river, but I see pretty big responses to snow melt and to stream flow. So it looks like it's hydrologically connected to the river still, which is pretty interesting. And something that uh, Cam at the Bureau was very interested in is what, how, how is this thing so connected, even though there's sort of a confining unit to the river way up here. Um, So here's DH21. Again, it's even more reactive. So you're seeing really strong fluctuations in water level. And I could pick a time here, any one of these dates, and I could pick off water levels and I could get uh, heads. Um, the piezometer here is right next to the um, so the piezometer is right next to the stream and would give you sort of an indication of the stream water level. All right, so you could even get sort of a, uh, oh, here's, here is the actual stream. So I could get water levels in the stream, in the, uh, in the piezometer right next to the stream, this well right here, and then in the, shallow aquifer and the deep aquifer. Uh, so here's the stream. That piezometer is right next to the stream. These two wells are just off of the stream, uh, about 50 feet. And I could get water levels for all of those and sort of look at their connection. For now, let's just, all I really want is the, uh, is, is this sort of conceptual model. What is the stratigraphy, hydrostratigraphy of the site? Um, okay, so then the other one we have is MDOT. All right, so Lolo Creek. Here is your MDOT wells. There's one, two, three wells at MDOT. 
All right, and so you got to draw the same kind of cross section um, for M the Montana Department of Transportation. Using those well logs, come up with your hydrostratigraphy. There is only info on M.1 and M.3. Okay, we'll just use those two wells then. Okay. For some reason, probably um, trying to remember the difference between two and three, but just use the just use the well logs you've got then. Okay, so that's basically, I think you've got everything you need to complete all of assignment four. Um, so the way I think we'll uh, proceed today is we'll cover most of the, uh, so the rest of the lecture today will cover essentially get as far as, as mostly that we're gonna lecture this week, um, which is the last week of classes. Then Thursday, we'll do a lab um, that includes slug test interpretation and well interpretation. Um, so you'll get some practice in interpreting both well data and slug test data. And then we will, um, uh, That'll take probably the first hour of the class, and then the second hour of the class, we'll just um, sort of review and talk about the exam. Um, so let's, uh, any other questions on homework four while we're at it? It looks like maybe we won't be able to answer 5C either. 5C. Sure, yeah, you, you're because you're going to do, you've done the TICE method for part A, so you can answer 5C. Okay. Um, so Jacob asked, is the homework still due today? Uh, let's make the homework due Thursday. You've already done most of five as part of your lab. Um, so really all that should be left is 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 four. Um all right, any other homework questions? Okay. Well, if not, we'll uh, start back in the lecture. Hey, real quick, um, yeah. not about the homework, but what day next week is our exam? Next week, the exam, let's pull up the, uh, Let's pull up the syllabus. Wednesday, May 6th, 8 to 10. So, yeah, Wednesday, May 6th, 8 to 10. Uh, 
Um, yeah, and, and my plan is just to have it at the regular time because that's been designed to not conflict with other exams as much as possible. Um, it'll be the same format as the last test we took, same length. Um, so pretty much very similar to exam two. Half of the material will be over what we've covered since exam two, and then the other half will be sort of cumulative. Uh, so we'll include material from exam one and exam two, but the length will be the same. We'll do it uh, the same way. So you'll have about three hours um, to finish it up and turn it in. If anyone has time conflicts, just uh, let me know and we'll figure out how to, how to manage those. Can I ask a question about the paper? Yep. Okay, so I've been working on it and your little outline. Um, so we're kind of working towards the section for the water resources, kind of the water budget. Do you want them all to be like amount about the same amount of information or just kind of what's necessary to then discuss in part four? And is part four stuff that we take from sources or do you want us to calculate the changes in storage? Uh, so they don't all need to have the same amount of information. They all need to cover the amount of information needed for you to, to tell, tell your story. Um, for the water budget calculations, you're, I mean, you're going to have to do a little bit of both. You're going to have to really see what's been done. Um, you're going to find that whatever estimates you have for recharge rates or withdrawal rates, um, they're going to be estimates. And I doubt you'll find any information on sort of estimated changes in storage. So you're probably going to have to calculate your own changes in storage um, and make your own inferences. You may, depending on your area, not even have estimates of recharge. And so um, then you've got to come up with some way to come up with a first order estimate or recharge. Um, and so some examples there, are if your recharge rate is more than your annual precipitation or your sort of average precipitation rate, then something's wrong, right? You can't have more recharge than precipitation. Um, well, you can actually, uh -huh. you can. I shouldn't be so blatantly, uh, <laughs> um, black and white about that. If you have an irrigated area, you can have higher recharge than, than precipitation. But the bottom line is those estimates need to be based upon some, some measurement or, you know, some, uh, physical hydrologic reasoning. Um, so if, for example, I only had, uh, estimates of precipitation and evapotranspiration, then a reasonable re estimate of recharge would be to take average precip minus average evapotranspiration and see what my sort of long-term average recharge rate might be. Um, there's a couple things I want right. you guys to grapple with as you do this is, and one is that the information is likely not going to be really apparent. And, um, and that's part of working in hydrogeology. There's very few places where people are going to have published recharge rates. And even if they are, those recharge rates, you know, if there was a couple studies, probably each study would have a different published recharge rate. And so you got you to gotta sift through this information. Um, and in many cases, you're going to have to come up with your own estimates. So so most hydrogeologists, when they start trying to come up uh, with their conceptual model, um, are going to have to come up with an estimate or recharge. And they, so this is a super common problem. 
how do you how do you actually make the estimate so yeah the short answer is they don't all need to be the same length they need to cover the appropriate material all right thanks any other questions about the paper okay I'll take silence as an indication that everybody's bored and wants to move on to lecturing. I'm just real quick. When, when is that due? The paper? Uh, yeah. When did I say it was due? Uh, <clears throat> it is due. Let's let's make it do the Monday of exam week. So let's write that down. Paper is due. Monday, the 4th, by the, by midnight. That way by Wednesday, you're done with your hydrogeology. Okay, thank you. May 4th at midnight. And you're welcome to turn it in before that. Okay. So let's um, let's talk about a real. <clears throat> any more questions about logistics before we get started lecturing? Okay, so um, one of the uh, one of the ways that we can interrogate aquifers. So a pump test is sort of the gold standard um, and, and um, is the best way to characterize your groundwater system. However, it requires pumping for a long time, recording heads, um, and, um, and really usually a pumping well and an observation well, right? That's essentially the way the TICE method works. We're gonna pump at some well and then we observe in another well. Um, so another way that we can get at least some indication of aquifer properties, um, and it's, it's not, the information isn't quite as robust, but it is useful is are called slug tests. So <clears throat> um, the basic idea of a slug test is that we've got a well that's finished
and uh, screened in, we're going to say this well's fully screened across an unconfined aquifer. So I've got my well here. It's uh, screened in the aquifer and I've got the water level matches the unconfined water table. All right. So the idea is I'm going to take a metal slug. So the first uh, of these slugs were metal. All right, and it's just uh, a metal volume that fits in well. All right, and the idea is I'm gonna put that slug down into my well. So I drop it in here real fast. All right, and now I drop the slug in. Okay, so what do you think if I drop this slug into my well, what's going to happen to the water level in my well? What do you think is going to happen? It will, it will rise. Why? Because it's displacing water and it won't be able to leave the gasometer so soon, so it'll rise up. Yeah, so the minute we drop it in, all right, we've added all this volume to our well, all right, and so we're going to see an immediate rise in the water table inside our well, right? Or the water level inside our well. Okay, so then what do you think's gonna happen? What's gonna happen now? I've got this higher water level inside my well. What do you, what do you think's gonna happen to it? It'll like slowly, um, it's gonna drain. Yeah, so I've got a higher head inside the well now, all right? And so my water is going to come out, all right? It'll drain out my well. And so this water level will fall back through time, back to the original water level, all right? So if I was to look in time at my, so here's time. Here's my head. Okay, we're at cruising along at H naught, our static water level. We drop the slug in really fast. So our head jumps up, all right? And then it decays back down to the original water level. So this is slug in, all right? Drops back down to H not the original water level, all right? Then the next thing I usually do in a slug test is I pull the slug out really fast. What do you think happens then? So now I yank the slug out. Uh, wouldn't it, wouldn't it uh, depress the water level? Why? Because you're removing uh, you're removing some volume, uh, the buoyancy. You're removing the, the mass of the slug. So the buoyancy is going to compensate by depressing. So 
Doesn't have much to do with buoyancy, but it does have a lot to do with the volume that we pulled out. So you're right. We pulled, we just pulled like instantaneously a bunch. It's exactly like pulling out instantaneously a bunch of water. All right. So yeah, if I pull the slug back out, my water level is going to drop. All right. And then it's slowly going to fill to refill that water level. Now I've got lower head in my aquifer and then it will refill back up to the initial. So we get this kind of curve. All right. So here's slug out. All right. Slug in, decay, come back to normal water level slug out, we drop the water level and it comes back up to the original. All right, so <clears throat> for one sort of slug test cycle, we're going to do essentially two tests, a slug in and a slug out. And then depending on the rate at which these sort of uh, curves occur, we'll probably do this several times. Okay, so the, ba the basic idea of slug test is that the response time, so how long it takes, so the recovery So recovery time, do you think it's faster if we have higher hydraulic conductivity or slower if we have higher hydraulic conductivity? Faster. Okay, so really super intuitively, if we have higher conductivity, we're going to expect a faster response. And conversely, if we have lower conductivity, we would get a slower response. Okay, real intuitive. Um, all right, so <clears throat> guy named Horslev, uh, started doing these slug tests and he started plotting um, well first of all let's define the drawdown ratio And that is the drawdown at some time over the initial drawdown. All right, so this is H naught minus HT. All right, so this is the this is the head 
my sort of long-term average head minus my head at some time, all right? So let's pick a time. We'll just pick some time here. So this is my head at my at HT. This is H naught, my sort of long-term average time head. This is my initial displacement, H sub I, all right? So what this is, it's normalized by my total, so this total drop here is H naught. minus h sub i. So I'm normalizing at any time the difference h naught minus h t I'm just comparing this drop h h naught minus h t to the total initial drop. All right? That's this drawdown ratio. Okay, so let's look at what the drawdown ratio would do. The reason why we do this, let's plot drawdown ratio. Versus time for a slug test. All right, it's going to start. I'm going to make the zero line here and the one line here. It would start at zero. It would pop up to one, decay back down to zero, pop back up to one, decay back down to zero. All right, doesn't flop signs and the, it always stays between zero and one. So that's why we use the drawdown ratio for both of my slug tests, both slug in and slug out. For both of my slug tests, it stays between zero and one and it just decays back down to zero. So it's just a way of normalizing this thing so the curve is always in the same bounds and is always between zero and one, all right? Doesn't switch signs. All right, so Horslav uh, is, is a guy and he goes in and he starts doing a bunch of these slug tests and he basically notices this shape of the curve and he says, look, that looks pretty exponential, all right? So the curve is, is falling exponentially. All right, and so the basic idea here is we are going to define our drawdown as a function e to the minus k f a times t. All right, <clears throat> so this is the Horselev, uh, essentially the Horselev curve. Let's define these variables. A is the cross-sectional area. Uh, 
of the well. All right. K is my hydraulic conductivity. And F is my good old fudge factor. But this fudge factor also incorporates well configuration. All right, we're going to get into what F is and how we choose it in more detail. But for now, let's just say, you know, it's this kind of fudge factor and it's going to incorporate our well completion and well design. All right, so <clears throat> If I if I've got this exponential function, if I plot So here's time. And here's the log of H. All right, it's going to start at one. Which would actually be the log of H would be zero. And it's going to be we would see our head drop in a straight line. All right. And we could fit a straight line and we could pick off two points. P1. and P2. All right. Okay, the slope of this line is equal to minus K F over A. All right. And we're going to show you, but we're going to be able to we know F and we know A, so we're going to use the slope of this line to back out hydraulic conductivity. So if I take the uh, log of my function, I'm going to get log H is equal to, I'm writing in Python, I'm going to go back to math, natural log of H is equal to minus K F over A times T. All right, so I have Y is equal to M X. All right, so all I need to do is find <clears throat> the slope. I can do this by just looking at my two points, P1 and P2. I can rearrange this um, equation um, for the slope between two points. And I get this 
equation a f one t two minus t one lin h one over h two. All right, so this is plug in equation. And you end up with this relationship. K is equal to AF one over T one minus T two lin H one over H two, where P one and P two give me my points for P one has H one T one and P2 has H2, T2. Okay, so I can, from these two points on my plot, I can calculate an A and an F for my well, and then I can compare two points on this decay curve and I can calculate a hydraulic conductivity. All right, so the tricks now are A and F. And A, we just get from the cross sectional area. And F we're going to get from a table <clears throat> now. Let's see. If I can pull it up for you guys. All right, so this is uh, this is table twelve point one in your book. And it gives you shape factors, F, for a bunch of different well configurations. All right, so the first one, A, is for an uncased hole. So that's like we just drove um, PVC or just drove a hole into our sediment. All right. A fully screened well is exactly the same as a fully uncased hole. So if I come back here to my drawing, if I've got this well and it's screened, all right, as it is, it's screened across the full water table. All right, that acts essentially like there's no casing. There's nothing that impede water flow. The screen is, is basically just keeping the dirt from collapsing into the hole, but there's free water movement all up and down this pipe in and out of the, in and out of the hydraulic 
or in and out of the aquifer. So uncased hole is the same as fully screened. All right, so in that case, the shape factor is 16 pi, the depth of my hole, D, S times R, where R is um, the radius, all right, and S What is S? I got to remember what S is. I think it's the fully, I think it's the full depth of the aquifer. So let me make sure here. Might have to look in my code and see what I do for S. The book doesn't tell us anywhere where the heck S it, what the heck S is. Let's see here. Ah, uh, yeah, it is. S is the saturated thickness. I had to go all the way back to the horse lev paper to get that. All right, so S is the saturated thickness, so the full thickness of my aquifer. D is the depth. All right, so the bottom line is I can have all kinds of different configurations. A really common way that we might pound piezometers is to just pound PVC, fully cased PVC, no slots, all right? We pound it down into the ground uh, with a metal rod inside the PVC, and then we pull the metal rod out, all right? And so we have essentially a fully cased hole open at the bottom, all right? So this is a really common, B is a really common situation for shallow aquifer um, and shallow subsurface investigation. All right, in that case, my shape factor is 11 R, that's just the radius over two. Um, so there's all kinds of different configurations that my well might be. I could be, um, I could have casing only to the top of a confined aquifer. Um, fully screened. 
I could have various amounts of screening. I could have casing and have a certain amount of porous material up inside my casing. All right, so each one of these is a different configuration. Um, I could have driven casing with a screen length. This is another really common, is that I drive a bit of casing and a length of screen with it. And, I, and now I've got cased hole plus some screened or perforated distance. Each one of these now has a different F factor. And here they've also solved the equation um, for you use the straight line, pick two points, and you can calculate the hydraulic conductivity using this uh, straight line. All right, so Horslev is, I'd say, the work, the workhorse of slug test interpretation. The basic idea is that we have this um, exponential decay, and that we have to modify this exponential decay for our well configuration. All right, there are other methods of slug test interpretation that um, that are common. But the horse lev is the workhorse. It's the most common And the reason why is we can use it for a variety of well configurations. And both in confined and unconfined aquifers. Um, and we modify it for all these different configurations through the shape factor. So the real trick in a horse lab slug test is picking your appropriate shape factor for the well and the aquifer that you're in. All right, there are other methods that of varying sophistication. Um, and just given the amount of time we have right now, I feel like going into those, into details on those methods is, is probably not the most important thing we could be doing. Um, I'm just going to say that um, there's a couple methods we have um, that you should know of that are fairly common and are presented in your books. Um, So some other methods. That can be used. Are the Cooper. Bredehoff. and Papadopoulos.
method. And this is an analytical solution um, for a confined aquifer with a fully penetrating well. So if you're in this particular setting of a confined aquifer with a fully penetrating well, this method is an exact solution to that, to that setting and is more accurate, right? So it's more accurate for this particular setting. than the horse left. And fundamentally, just more aesthetically pleasing because you're actually solving the partial differential equation. But it is, um, it is a lot harder to use. So I'll just write down the, uh, I'll write down the equation. All right, so it's this really complicated integral. Um, it's a function of beta, which is transmissivity times time, R squared, C. This is the radius of the casing. Um, alpha is R S squared S R squared C. Uh, this is the effective radius of the well. All right, and these guys, J naught and Y naught are Bessel functions. Of, Sir, wouldn't you? Of the first and second order. Okay. All right. Dr. Gardner. Yep. When you say the effective radius of the well, is that like 
you have the casing and then you have the actual well tube that's the that's the radius good question so remember i've got an open hole and that would be the casing right well inside that open hole i've got casing mm -hmm. and then between the open hole and the casing i've got whatever it is sand usually sand pack mm -hmm. all right so the effective radius of the well is usually re that's like the open borehole diameter and then oh, okay. rc would be this guy all right okay so a couple things here first of all you can see this is a really complicated integral here anytime you're dealing with bessel functions somebody's done some some hardcore math all right and um so none of this happens you don't get to draw a straight line and then use this cute like k is equal to a couple of things in a natural log all right you're doing you're you're having to calculate this full integral you're having to deal with bessel functions um so you're not going to do this in excel right whereas this one you could do in excel pretty easy um There's a couple nice things about the Cooper Bredehoff and Papadopoulos um, method. And the first one is that, hey, we get storativity. And that's really important because in all these slug tests for horse lev, you don't get any storage. You're only estimating hydraulic conductivity. So we get storativity, which is really important. We get transmissivity and storativity. And so it, it is better and it, it's a better method because we get to estimate both of these values but um, it's significantly harder. And so most people don't use it unless they have the software to run it. Now in lab, we'll do, we'll do a Cooper Bredehoff and Papadopoulos matching uh, in Thursday. Um, and that's because I've written this integral up, all right? And so you can get K and S. But um, you're gonna have to use some kind of special software to do this method. And so it just gets used less. But if you are in this setting where you have a confined aquifer and a fully penetrating well, then it is the gold standard and it is what you should use because you can get both hydraulic conductivity and storage. Um, There's another uh, method that we will um, mention quickly, and that is for unconfined aquifer. And this is the uh, Bauer Rice slug test. And this is for an unconfined aquifer, fully or partially penetrating well. Uh, 
Um, I I I'm just going to say that uh well if you're in this scenario where you're an unconfined aquifer a foliar penetrating well um, you can use the Bauer Rice method. Um, it is again significantly more complicated than the um, than the horse left. And um, I don't want to spend much more time delving into the specifics of it. But it it is again it's a it's a little better than the horse left method, but it's it's significantly more complicated. Um, I just feel that we can use our time better than getting into the details of these different slug test methods. Um, but what I want you to take home is that. If you are in an aquifer characterization um, program or you're doing graduate research and you want to know and parameterize things like um, hydraulic conductivity of material slug tests or something you're probably going to end up using because they're quick and easy, um, there's a variety of methods depending upon your setting. So horse lab is a good place to start. Um, and it's reasonably accurate, you know, it's okay, it's accepted method, um, but that there are lots and lots of other methods developed for particular settings. And so it could be that it's worth an investigation for depending upon your particular setting into other methods um, like the Bauer Rice or the Cooper Bredehoff Papadopoulos. um that will give you more accurate and more information all right let's take a uh let's take just a couple minute break um because the next the next topic i want to um talk about is an important one um and i just got to get my thoughts together a little bit on it um so two minute break and then we'll discuss superposition. Okay, <clears throat> I wanna start off our discussion of superposition by thinking about a, a mental question here. So let's say we're looking down in map view here. All right. And we have two wells here. So this is a uh, well one. And we got well two. All right. And this well here is pumping at a rate Q1. All right. And this well here is pumping at a rate Q2. All right. So two pumping wells. These are in a. Uh, they're pumping from a homogeneous confined aquifer. All 
All right. And I've got, I want to know what the drawdown is. at this point A. <clears throat> All right, so my question is, this is a common scenario. We are, we've got some place um, A where we're interested in what the water level is and we have multiple pumping wells that would be interacting and potentially causing drawdown at point A. So the question is, how do we deal with interacting pumping wells. All right, so in order to, to calculate drawdown at A, we're, we have to deal with the fact that pumping at both W1 and W2 would be causing drawdown at A. So both W1 and W2 are causing drawdown at A. Okay, so <clears throat> how do you, how would you, how would you guys calculate? Let's get rid of, first of all, Let's just consider pumping from one well, say W1, all right? What method could I use to calculate the drawdown at A from pumping at W1 in a confined aquifer? So we could use the cone of influence. Okay, so yes, we could calculate the cone of depression, depression. From, from pumping at well one. What, what solution or what method would we use for a confined aquifer to calculate drawdown at a point away from that pumping well? The Tice equation? Yeah, okay, so we could use Tice equation to give us drawdown. So effect of well one we could get we could use tice to calculate drawdown from W1. Now Tice and the solution for the Tice equation was only for one pumping well, all right? So it's easy for me, I can use Tice, I can easily calculate what the drawdown is at A from the Tice solution, but it only allows for pumping from one well. So how, how could we consider the influence from two wells? So you could <clears throat> do each one separately and then uh, once you find each one separately, then you could maybe use something along the lines of Pythagorean theorem to, to cancel it out and make it into one. Okay, so Marx brought up this idea that we could 
calculate the influence from each one separately and then figure out some way to combine them. So, so first of all, the question is this, if you've got a solution, an analytical solution that was derived for boundary conditions, assuming that an aquifer of infinite extent and one pumping well, all right, how can I take that solution and sort of combine two of those solutions um, at, in a way that's, that's legal? Like, is it okay to just combine the drawdown from one solution and the drawdown from another when they were derived for a situation where there was no other pumping well? Uh, no, you would have to somehow normalize it or, or account. Uh, shoot, I used to remember how to do this. You so, would have to, yeah. So, this idea brings up this really important point. So Mark is on the right track. We have to figure out how to estimate the individual effects and then figure out how that they would sum up, all right? So <clears throat> when you take, if you take an ordinary differentials class or a partial differentials class, you learn about the principle of superposition. And the really dry math definition of the principle of superposition says, if I have, if a solution to a partial differential equation to a PDE to a linear Uh, let's see, how do I, how am I going to say this cleanly? The basically what, what the principle of superposition says, solutions to linear partial differential equations where linear is really important, linear PDEs can be simply added together. All right, what this means for us in the world of hydrogeology all right, the importance of this, of this principle of superposition cannot be overestimated. What it means is that if I want to calculate the drawdown at A, I calculate the drawdown from W1 as if W2 didn't exist. All right, that's the Tice equation. I say, look, let me calculate the drawdown from W1 using the Tice solution which only says there's one pumping well in an aquifer of infinite extent, never interacts with another one, all right? But then I do the same thing for W2. I calculate the drawdown at A from W2 alone as if W1 doesn't exist, all right? And the real life drawdown at A is just the addition of the drawdown from W1 plus the drawdown of W2. I don't have to do anything fancy. So the total drawdown at A is simply the drawdown from W1 plus the drawdown from W2. So in other words, the drawdown at S sub A is equal to the drawdown from one 
as if W2 didn't exist, plus the drawdown from two as if W1 didn't exist. And this is the principle of superposition in action. All right, <clears throat> what that means is I can now consider in really, really complicated settings. All right, so I may, let's say I thought I was in the middle of a well field. All right, I'm in a, I'm looking in map view, I'm in a confined aquifer and I've got a bunch of wells. Let's say I'm running a remediation uh, project and I am injecting wells. I have injection wells. So this guy is injecting at um, a couple rates. These guys are extracting. at different rates. All right, so I'm injecting at different rates, I'm extracting at different rates, and I want to know what the head is going to be here at this position. Well, I can just calculate the influence from injection at these two wells and extraction from these two wells by simply calculating the drawdown or the um, expansion or addition of water from these, from each well individually and just add them all together. All right, so I can consider really complicated situations by adding together simple solutions. All right, and these can be everything from just Tice equations like we're talking about here to adding together, say, an analytical solution for um, propagation. I may have a scenario like this. Let's look at something in cross section. So here's a cross section. I've got a river at H naught. All right. And then I've got a well that's pumping over here. Let's see, we got a confined aquifer here. Now, this water level rises from H naught to H sub I or H sub T. All right, we get a water level rise. And at the same time, we turn on this pumping well. And what we might be interested in is what is the head in an observation well over here gonna look like? Well, I have an analytical solution for a step change. at the boundary. And I have an analytical solution for pumping. 
So this was the Tice equation. And this one was look something like this H is equal to H naught. And there was an Earth C in here. Um, had SY. And so we had another analytical solution that was the complementary error function. And it had like T over square root two uh, K. x all right and we so we had this solution and now i could calculate the head at this well by adding simply adding tice equation plus the step change equation and i could predict what the head at this well is all right so superposition allows me to consider really complicated situations by just adding together by simple addition the solutions to more complicated equations. All right, this becomes incredibly useful for hydrogeologists and um, allows us to consider much, much more complicated settings than we have a single analytical solution for. All right. So Thursday, I will um, have a lab. Um, I'll have one version that works for Python 2 and one version that works for Python 3, because I have people with both. And then um, we will uh, we'll, we'll do some slug test interpretation and some pump test interpretation on the computer. I'll probably lecture for about another 20 minutes before that, just on how we use some other applications of superposition that I want you guys to know about. Um, all right, so I'm done lecturing for the day. We will, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Um, I will start office hours um, and you guys can ask questions at will. Are you just going to stay on, sir, or are you going to go? No, to I'm going to go to the other one in case people from the other class want to join office hours.